Welcome back, everybody, to the Jacksonville Jaguars franchise here on Madden 21. As today, we have a different type of episode for you. Obviously, our season is now over with the loss in the divisional round against the Buffalo Bills. And I kind of want to do a season recap slash offseason preview today. We're going to go over what happened throughout the season and dissect the future of this Jaguar squad look at the futures of some of the players on the roster, and look at some guys we could target in the upcoming NFL draft. So obviously, you all most likely saw the previous episode in which we unfortunately lost to the Buffalo Bills in the division round of the postseason, 27-24. It was a hard-fought battle in the snow, but unfortunately, we were not able to get the win, and our Cinderella season would come to a close. This was certainly an interesting game, a lot of ups, a lot of downs, and I think that's how you can describe how Gardner Minshew played. He was certainly not as good as he played in the wild card round, that doesn't say much because Gardner Minshew was outstanding in the wild card round against Cleveland. Today he had his fair share of mistakes through a pair of interceptions thanks to Tredavious White being insane. Uh, Josh Allen was also average, I mean he wasn't bad. But the Bills were fueled by their rushing attack, and I think the run game was the big difference today. Devin Singletary and Juice Johnson both played really well for the Bills, and for us, we once again could not run the ball at all, and really the past like five or six games, we've been unable to run the ball. Receiving-wise, Dawson Knox had a big game for Buffalo. We just still cannot cover tight ends. That's definitely something we're going to have to fix in the offseason because our team has just been so bad this year against tight ends. Uh, Zeke Bowman, he stepped up in the postseason, not necessarily as much in this game, only two catches, but they were both big ones. LaVisca Chenault played well in the first half, but didn't do much in the second half. Aguilar played well. Looking at the offensive line, A.J. Khan, who had a great season this year, he actually struggled, allowed two sacks to Ed Oliver. Josh Allen, two tackles for loss, he played really well in the run game for us. Number of players had sacks, Tredavious White had two interceptions for the Bills, Dre White is shut down, and uh, Joe Schobert had one for us, and then the Bills did have a fumble forced by Jason Barrett, which was recovered by Ed Oliver. So looking at the rest of the playoffs so far, going into the conference championships, the Ravens beat the defending champion Patriots, the Giants beat the Bears, and the Washington football team upset the one-seeded Eagles. So... In an NFC East clash throughout this entire season, the division that had all four teams in the postseason, it looks like we will have an NFC East team in the Super Bowl with Washington facing off against the Giants in the conference championship, and then the top two seeds in the AFC in Buffalo and Baltimore. So before we take a look at who is in the Super Bowl, I do want to briefly look at these Pro Bowl rosters, see who we have here. The teams that are in the Super Bowl won't have any players on this team, so if you notice some stars on those rosters are not here, that's probably why. Obviously, DJ Chark made it. That's not a surprise. He was probably the best receiver in football this year. Our other offensive player who made it was center Brandon Linder, who doesn't get talked about all that much, but that's probably a good thing because unlike most of our offensive line this year, Linder actually stayed healthy, and he's been consistent throughout the entire season, so he definitely deserves this Pro Bowl nod. Nobody on defense. I'm a little bit surprised C.J. Henderson didn't make it, but outside of that, I don't really think anybody deserved it. Maybe Ronnie Harrison, maybe Miles Jack. Jack only played like 12 games. If he was healthy the full season, he probably would have made it. And then both of our special teamers, Josh Lambeau and Logan Cook, make it, which is good to see. They both deserve it. So we finished with four pro bowlers, Chark, Linder, Lambeau, and Cook. No major obje objections from me outside of C.J. Henderson, who had a really good season for us. So as you can see, the Super Bowl will be between the Giants and the Ravens. Baltimore beat Buffalo handedly in the AFC Championship, and then the Giants destroyed Washington in the NFC Championship. The Giants were the worst team in the NFL last year. They had the number one pick, in which they drafted Lewis Kahn out of West Lake, and now they have a chance to win the Super Bowl the following season, which is crazy. The Ravens have another former West Lake linebacker in Joe Brewer, so it looks like a Hornet will end up winning a Super Bowl this year. So now it is time to recap our season. We're going to be looking throughout the draft class, look at some potential 
J future Jacksonville Jaguars. This is a really talented draft class, and I'm really excited to see what these rookies can do at the next level. So we're going to go through the team, starting with the quarterback play, and obviously it was an up-and-down season from Gardner Minshew. Uh, Minshew played well as the season went along. He really struggled early on, and obviously there were rumblings about him getting benched for Tyrod Taylor, and I really thought about it. But we stuck it through with Minshew. He played well down the stretch. He played really well in the playoff game against Cleveland. And he's a fine starting quarterback. But can he ever be a very good starting quarterback? That's my question. His numbers were very similar to his stats last year across the board. And his contract is up after next year. Do we want to pay Gardner Minshew top dollar? Because I do imagine that he will command a very high contract, and I don't know if we're willing to give that to him, because while he's a serviceable starter, I think that is his ceiling for the most part. He's a high floor, low ceiling guy. He's going to be a serviceable starter in this league for a while, but does he have the upside to ever be a really good starter? So quarterback is certainly a position we're going to look at in the offseason, and this is a really talented QB class headlined by Marcus Trotter out of Ole Miss. Unless we move up into the top five, then we're not sniffing Marcus Trotter. He's going to be picked really high. The Falcons have the top pick. They could look at him. He's not falling past New Orleans. They need a quarterback badly. There's also Steven Westwood, the ever-projected first-round quarterback out of West Lake. Obviously, we know Steven Westwood very well on this channel, so I'm sure he's going to do great in the NFL. And then some interesting mid-round guys. Kendrick Savage, the second out of Illinois. Very talented player. There are some medical concerns with him, but I think he's really good. And then another mid-round guy to watch out for is Coco Onwosu out of Michigan State. Only 20 years old. He is super raw, but he's also super young. And I think picking a guy like Onwosu in the second or third round makes sense for Jacksonville because he can sit behind Minshew for a year, and once the season is up... Minshew can walk in free agency, and Onwosu can become the starter. I think you can say that about Kendrick Savage the second as well. I think Savage is raw too, so he would make sense there as well. It seems like the comment section from the last episode really wants us to look at a new quarterback and not have Gardner Minshew as the franchise guy, so let me know what you think we should do in the comments below. Now looking at the run game, the run game started off really well this year. Through the first three quarters of the season, there was no issues. Then our whole starting offensive line got hurt, and then it went downhill very quickly. Now Philip Lindsay still had a pretty good year, a career high in yards for him. He also ran for seven touchdowns, but I want to give him less touches this upcoming season because for a guy who's 5'8", 190, I don't think giving him 250 touches is a smart idea. He's also going to be, I think, 28 next year, so he's not getting any younger. Philip Lindsay's under contract for one more year, so after next year, we could hypothetically let him go, and we do want to start looking at the running back of the future. Unfortunately, I don't think the running back of the future is on the roster at the moment. I do like Kyra Brooks. He didn't play all that well for us this season, averaging around three yards per carry, but I do think he's talented. So this running back class is stacked. Headlined by Malik Perkins out of Texas A&M, who is a really, really good player. I really have no clue where he's going to go just because it's so hard to predict where running backs are going to get drafted. So there is a chance he could fall to Jacksonville's pick in the later part of the first round. Maybe Jacksonville picks a guy like Perkins and grooms him to be the running back of the future. There are some good mid-round running backs, including Taj Mayfield the third out of Baylor, who is built like a tank, 5'10", 230. Steven Woods, Vladimir Poco, and Tario Collier are other good day two options. And then looking at day three, Jason Mellon, Angus Jenkins, D. Duncan, all really good options. And another intriguing name is R.J. Ewell out of East Carolina. Ewell just entered the draft class. He just declared. There are a few players who did just declare for the draft. We will briefly go over them. Most of the guys who just declared are from West Lake. However, there are a few instances like RJ Ewell who are from different schools. So now looking at the receiving, and obviously we have our number one receiver set for the next five plus years. DJ Chark is the most important player on this team. He's the best player on this team. We just locked him up on a big contract. 
towards the beginning of this season. I want to say it's five years, 80 mil. And based on his production these past two seasons, I feel like that contract is an absolute bargain for him just because he is such an important player for our team. 86 catches this year over 1,500 yards and 11 touchdowns. I didn't think he'd be able to play as well as he did last year, and he played even better. So it's really good to know that he's going to be under contract for us these next five years. Three Pro Bowl appearances, and he did win the AFC's Best Receiver Award. Luckily, Zach Paschal did not rob him two years in a row. DJ Chark should have won it last year. They gave it to Pascal of the Colts. And they almost gave it to Zach Pascal again, who is now on the New England Patriots. Outside of Chark, however, there are a lot of question marks. We do have plenty of talented players, including Nelson Aguilar, who we signed to a one-year contract in the offseason. And he was really good, in my opinion. He was great coming out of the slot. He played really well in the playoffs. I believe he scored in both games, including the game winner in the game against Cleveland. I'm definitely not opposed to bringing him back, but it depends on the price. It's also worth noting that he is going to start regressing, so certainly something we have to consider. There's also LaVisca Chenault, who's had a very up-and-down start to his career. He's a talented player, but... I really don't think that we have totally figured out how to use him correctly, which is why I think the jury is still out on LaVisca Chenault. Now, he still has two years left on his contract, so there's plenty of time with him, but I don't think it hurts to really assess the wide receiver position in the offseason and try to go after some younger guys who could eventually replace him. At tight end, we're in a really interesting predicament here with David Njoku, who's been very good these past two seasons, ever since we acquired him from the Browns for Yannick Ngakwe. He's played well, but he is a free agent this offseason. I think he's asking for around six or seven mil a year, and I feel like tight end is a pretty replaceable position, especially with someone like Njoku, who has had some drop issues this year and isn't a great blocker. So, I'm very undecided on whether I'm going to bring him back or not. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. And we do have some young guys who could develop and become future starters, like Zeke Bowman. We saw his potential unleashed in the playoffs. There's also Daniel Romer at tight end. You got to watch out for him. So, this receiver class is a little bit weak, especially with Carter Westwood returning to school for his senior season. There are some guys in the middle rounds I like, including Darnell Middlebrooks from Nebraska, mid-first-round talent. He isn't overly athletic, but I think he could fit in the slot and replace Nelson Aguilar. There's also Joshua Thomas, who recently entered the draft class at well, as well. He's a little bit raw, but he's only 20 years old, and I like his upside. And then you got to watch out for the speedster, Casey Shock, out of Toledo. This man is blazing fast and I think could be a really fun player to add to the squad. So we're probably not going to look at receiver early in the draft, but throughout the middle of the draft, don't be surprised if we select one. And also in free agency, certainly worth noting that we will be looking at receivers there. And then the tight end class is also pretty weak. There are some good players in here, including Jermaine Jenkins out of Iowa, who will probably go in the second round. And then some late round guys I like, Jake Burke out of Florida State and Simba Azakiwe out of Duke. The offensive line, for the most part, was really good this year. They did struggle down the stretch, mainly because of injuries. And outside of left tackle Bentley Vonder Wilson, I don't think anybody else on the offensive line has their future totally set for us. Brandon Linder, Andrew Norwell, and AJ Khan are all now 30. Khan and Norwell has also had their injury issues this season. And then at right tackle, Dwayne Brown is most likely going to retire. And then Jawan Taylor. Although Taylor did play really well this year, I'm not totally sold on him being the right tackle of the future. He does have another year before his contract is up, so I'm willing to give him another shot. But outside of Bentley Vonder Wilson, I'm not sold on anybody in this offensive line. For the most part, the offensive line class is pretty weak, but there are some good players in here, including Braylon Gerland, the left tackle out of Florida. Unfortunately, we will not be sniffing him. He will be an early first-round selection. There are some good players down the board here at left tackle. I really like Zoran Grubich out of Syracuse. I think he's very talented. Left guard, this class is also pretty good in. Justin Johnson and Jalil Owens are both solid targets right around where the Jaguars are going to pick in the first round. There's also Steven Allen. Former Westlake Hornet, who recently declared for the draft, did not allow any sacks this past season, and I think he's really good. 
Center, right guard, and right tackle are very weak positions in this draft class. So, for the most part, the O-line class this year is weak, especially at right guard. But, I mean, there's always free agency we look, can look at. There's also always the trade market. Also, there's Dwayne Morton out of Westlake at right tackle. He's really the only good lineman from the right side this year. So, kind of unfortunate, but, I mean, let's just hope Jawan Taylor can progress. The defense was very weird for us this season. We had a lot of guys play well, but as a unit, our defense was not good. There are a lot of positives, including Miles Jack, and as you can see, he has gone up to Superstar X Factor, and that is a very big deal with the development trait progression being the Super Bowl week. There are players around the league going up in dev trait. We had two players, both on defense, go up in dev, including Miles Jack, who had an outstanding season this year when healthy. And there's also Rashawn Babin I want to talk about. As we go through the linebackers specifically, obviously Miles Jack is great. And I am lumping Babineau in with the linebackers because I think as the sub-linebacker, I think that's where his future is. And I really like the Miles Jack Rashawn Babineau duo going forward. Babineau won AFC Defensive Rookie of the Year this year and well deserved. This is a guy who can do a little bit of everything. So I don't expect to go linebackers super early this year, but I would like to add another one. We do have some guys like Joe Schobert, Quincy Williams, Taga Talui Ipupu who are all solid, but it doesn't hurt to add more linebackers. There are some good players here like Denver Mullins, Maxwell Patterson who will be first rounders. David Harris out of Westlake is another player who just recently declared for the draft. Harris had a really good season this year with Westlake as a redshirt sophomore and will likely be a day three pick. However, I think he should go earlier than that. At right's outside linebacker, one of the bigger busts to watch out for this year is Cameron Holland out of UCLA. Projected to go in the top 10, but he looks like a bust. And the player behind him, Josiah Woolrich out of USC, is actually really good. So there are some good first round linebackers, there are also some bad ones, as we now will look at the defensive line, specifically the pass rush. Looking at the sack numbers, I think we finished fourth in sacks this year, but nobody finished with more than eight sacks. Our main defensive ends were Josh Allen and Kayla Von Chason. Allen finished with a career low in sacks, although I don't think he was bad this year. Josh Allen's contract is up pretty soon. So that's certainly something we're going to have to watch out for. And then it was really nice to see Caleb Von Chason progress this year. He definitely took a leap from his rookie season. That was very encouraging. I thought Odenabu as a rotational pass rusher played well this year. Sheldon Rankins also had six sacks. Rankins only has one more year left, so I definitely want to look at defensive tackle going forward. And it doesn't hurt to look at the defensive end position as well. Delvin Hines is the best prospect in this class out of Westlake. He has more sacks than anybody in college football history and will probably be the number one pick to the Atlanta Falcons unless they decide that Matt Ryan is no longer their guy and they want to go with Marcus Trotter, the quarterback, instead. This defensive line class is absolutely stacked. Got some guys here like Isaiah Charles, Sephiris Bornang, who could be good late round gems. This is also a great class at the right end position. You have Chantrez Bickers, who is a set top 10 pick. Clarence Priester out of Georgia. Mike Wilson out of West Lake, both set first rounders. But the player I really want to talk about here is Atlantis Perego out of Mississippi State. Only has late first round talent, but his upside is through the roof. Reminds me of the Jaguars picking Caleb Von Chase on a couple years ago towards the later part of a first round. A raw but freakishly athletic edge rusher. If you can develop Perego, you're getting yourself a great player. Defensive tackle, again, this class is loaded, specifically in day two. Alex Vulians, Calvin Williams, Loa Loa Lepu, Devontae Sneed Gatsby, Christopher Christmas, Joaquin Tejada. Really good day two guys, and I want to talk about Tejada specifically. This is a guy who just finished his senior season at Oklahoma State. Extremely talented player. Probably will be a top 10 pick. But there are questions with his commitment to playing in the NFL. He originally did not want to go pro. However, decided last second that he would enter the NFL draft. And 
It's not like he was a junior contemplating returning to school. He is a senior, so that is a little bit concerning. Another name at defensive tackle on day three to watch is Briar Fleetwood from Manitoba, Canada. So now looking at the secondary for the Jaguars, and it was really good to see CJ Henderson progress this year. As you can see, he has gone up to superstar X Factor. So Miles Jack and CJ Henderson were their two players for us who went up in dev trait. And they both have X Factor. Joining DJ Chark as the superstar X Factor players on our roster. And it was very encouraging to see CJ Henderson's play this year. Not only was he a ball hawk, but he was also an island. It was really hard to throw his way. And he was a legit shutdown corner this year. He really struggled as a rookie. Not only did he take a leap this year, but he took a massive leap, which was a very pleasant surprise to see. There's also our top pick from this past draft, Zaire Wiggins. Wiggins had an up and down rookie season. I will say this, Wiggins had a better rookie season this year than CJ Henderson did last year, so that's good. At safety, we have Gerard Wilson, who's a fine player, but he is a free agent. This offseason, and I'm not sure if Jacksonville really wants to bring him back. And the other safety is Ronnie Harrison, who is one of the most interesting players on this roster. Ronnie Harrison seemed like an afterthought at the beginning of the season. Solid starter, but not much more than that. Probably a guy that Jacksonville would let go. But Ronnie Harrison was excellent this year. Definitely a breakout season from him. He went up to superstar development midseason with a breakout challenge. And this guy just transformed himself into, in my opinion, one of the best safeties in the NFL this year. Four forced fumbles. He was a turnover machine. 107 tackles, 10 for a loss, both of which are career highs. He certainly really drove up his asking price. And it's going to be harder for Jacksonville to bring him back, obviously, because he's going to be more expensive. But at the same time, there's more reason for the Jaguars to bring him back. So another player who I'm really undecided on re-signing. But the talent with Ronnie Harrison is absolutely there. He had an outstanding season for us this year. So looking at the secondary class, it is a little bit weak at corner, which is fine because we've used two top 10 picks in the past two drafts in CJ Henderson and Zaire Wiggins. The top corner is Anthony Mitchell out of West Lake. And speaking of West Lake, there are a couple West Lake corners who have recently declared, including Tristan Moon, a very athletic player. Moon had a fine redshirt sophomore season for Westlake and has decided to enter the draft. And the other player from Westlake is Paul King, another redshirt sophomore. King is very raw, and he was not good this year at Westlake. However, he has decided to enter the draft anyway. If you want to take a shot on a really athletic prospect who has upside in the seventh round, Paul King is your guy. The upside with him is there, but I didn't see anything in college that told me this kid is an NFL pro. And then at safety, this class is absolutely loaded. Got a few first round three safeties in Thad Cage and Jalen Augustine Jr. Both of them are freak athletes. I can't wait to see what they do with the combine. Dwight Garrett in the second round, the brother of Preston Garrett, who is a quarterback the Vikings drafted last year. Also related to Cedric Garrett from the Cleveland Cavaliers. And then a few day two guys I like, Julius Williams and Marcus Granson. Watch out for them. Strong safety is a little bit weaker, but Dorian Seaver out of Texas A&M is really good. Probably going to go in the top 10 or 15. So that is the class for defense. Definitely expect this defense to look a little bit different this upcoming season. And then at special teams, the special teams was good this year for the most part. Josh Lambeau was really solid, 26 for 30 on field goals, 42 for 43 on PATs. And then for Logan Cook, well, no pun intended, he was definitely cooking this year. Half of his punts went inside the 20, which is insanely impressive. So, very good to see our kicker and punter both playing well. Obviously, they both made the Pro Bowl. So, we will briefly look at the special teams class at kicker. We're probably not going to draft a kicker this year. There are some talented players, including Sam Deerdorf, who is an early first-round talent, but he's also 28. So... Do you want to draft a 28-year-old kicker? I mean, he's going to be one of the better kickers in the NFL right away. I will say that. And then at punter, there are a few really good players. Greg Guillory from West Lake, Brian Amaya Jr. from Mississippi Valley State, and Federico Hernandez Rios from New Mexico State. 
So that will complete the season recap slash draft preview portion of today's episode. And now we're going to finish things off. We're going to look at what happened in the Super Bowl between the New York Giants and the Baltimore Ravens. Next year, we will play both the Giants and the Ravens for what it's worth because both us and Baltimore finished first in the division. And then we play the NFC East next year. So we will see both squads next year. And as you can see, the Ravens beat the Giants pretty convincingly in the Super Bowl. 45-22, to 22. so Lamar Jackson and company get themselves a Super Bowl ring. Lamar Jackson threw four touchdowns and one interception. On the flip side, Daniel Jones threw one touchdown and four <laughs> interceptions. Pretty rough day for him. The Giants also have Jeremy Watson, who they drafted in the third round last year at quarterback. That's an interesting storyline going forward. Aaron Jones with two touchdowns for the Ravens. Saquon Barkley also scored twice for the Giants, and then shout out to the fullback, Patrick Ricard, two receptions and two touchdowns. Not a lot of sacks allowed, there were quite a few sacks in this game. There's Lewis Kahn, he had seven tackles, two for a loss, so it looks like the number one overall pick, certainly making an impact for the Giants, and then interceptions, obviously the Ravens had a number of picks, and also former Westlake Hornet, Joe Brewer, is now a Super Bowl champion. I would have liked to have seen Lewis Kahn get a ring. Obviously, Kahn was certainly better at Westlake than Joe Brewer. Brewer was only a one-year starter, whereas Lewis Kahn was a four-year starter, and obviously he was the number one overall pick. But I'm very happy for Joe Brewer. He is now a Super Bowl champion. So now it's time to look at the retirements. Calais Campbell retires with a ring. Alex Smith retires as a member of the Washington football team. What an interesting career he had, but certainly a successful one. Jerry Hughes, Deshaun Jackson, Julian Edelman all hanging up the cleats. For us, we had two players retire, Sean Lee and Dwayne Brown. Sean Lee isn't a big deal. I signed him midseason to just get a veteran in the locker room. But Dwayne Brown is a pretty big deal. I was expecting him to retire, so I'm not very surprised. But that is one of our starters from last year, calling it a career. Ben Roethlisberger also retiring for the Steelers. They do not have their franchise quarterback on the roster, so maybe they'll look to draft a player. I think the Steelers are right in the range of where Stephen Westwood is probably going to go, so maybe he'll be a Steeler. A.J. Green, Geno Atkins retiring from the Bengals, and a few coaches also retiring, including John Harbaugh, who is now a two-time Super Bowl champion, John Gruden, that's a little bit surprising, and then Bruce Arians also retires. Looking at regression here, no major surprises for the most part. Obviously, the offensive linemen who are now 30, they're going to take some hits. Sheldon Rankins, Joe Schobert, Philip Lindsay, they are now all 28, so they're going to start getting hits. Same can be said about Cravon LeBlanc. Tyrod Taylor loses 14 points. And the only surprise for me in regression was Nelson Aguilar, who took a major hit. He loses 14 points and goes down to a 75 overall, so... That's not going to encourage us to bring back Aguilar next year, but on the bright side, he will probably be cheaper. So here is a full list of the guys who need to be re-signed. The big ones are David Njoku and Ronnie Harrison. And as you can see, Ronnie Harrison has gone back down to star development, which is a little bit odd. The dev trait regression is back in the game, so players can go down in dev trait. And I have decided to keep that feature on because I do think it is good for players to go down. Now, Ronnie Harrison does not deserve to go down. He was really good this year, so that one is a little bit surprising. Other than that, AJ Khan, I totally forgot about him. He needs a new contract. I expect us to re-sign him because he's been really good. And Aguilar as well. So Njoku, Harrison, Aguilar, and Khan are probably the big four. As you can see, Miles Jack and CJ Henderson have also gone down to star dev. It looks like the dev trait regression thing is broken. These two just moved up to X-Factor, and now they're going down to star. I don't really know how that make, makes much sense, so I'm going to give Henderson and Jack their X-Factors back, because obviously, as you can tell, the game is kind of bugging here, so I'll make sure those two guys get their correct dev traits, and it does seem like the game was smart about other players going down in dev. Aaron Rodgers just threw 20 interceptions, so his... Dev trade is going down. Like, that one makes sense. Maybe that's my inner Packers hatred. For those who don't know, I'm a Lions fan, and I really dislike the Packers. But, I mean, it makes sense. Aaron Rodgers has thrown 41 interceptions in the past two seasons. 
So that will end the episode. I hope everybody enjoyed. The plan is free agency, I think, will be on Thursday, and the draft will be on Saturday, both of which will be premiered on the channel. Hope you guys are excited for that. I know I am. Let me know what you think we should do in the offseason, free agency, and the draft. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. I'm out. Peace.